There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a collection of short stories from Korea entitled A Man, and the author is Wong Soon Won. Now you'll see how it is rendered in English characters there. Everything else I found online renders his second name, which is not his surname, but the other name. I, I always stumble around to say it's not a Christian name when it comes from Korea. The second name is usually spelled S-U-N not S-O-O-N, if you're searching for anything else by this writer. Wong Soon Won is one of Korea's most revered writers, and I had never heard of him. I bought this little collection at a secondhand bookstore here in Tokyo years ago. It sat neglected on my shelf for several years, and I finally cracked it for the Asian Readathon this month. This is published as part of the series called The Portable Library of Korean Literature which is published in Korea. I will put a link in the show notes. It's published by Ji Moon Dang Publishing Company in Seoul. And there are about 40 or 50 of these little booklets uh, of translated Korean literature. And none of them are available in the West. I have searched, but I did find the publisher's website. And yes, they do appear to all be in print. So I'm actually going to... I better do it before you watch this video, because you're going to beat me to it and they'll be sold out. But... I want the whole set of these based on how good this was. Translated from the Korean by Bruce and Ju Chan Fulton, who are a couple that are based in Vancouver, my old stomping grounds, at the University of British Columbia. And this little book, which has three short stories in it, was published in 2003, and the Fultons are still very active and translating all the time, including a whole bunch of stuff by Wong Soon Won. I love this collection of short stories. I can't believe it was languishing on my shelves all this time. And I just thought the translation was superb. The stories were excellent. And I want to read everything that's available by Wong Soon Won. By the way, that's how the videos on YouTube by the Korean Translation Agency, something like that, uh, are pronouncing his name. So I think that I can safely say Wong Soon Won. Um, this maybe is going to be difficult to find unless you're willing to order it from the publisher in Korea. This particular book, but there's quite a bit else that's available and translated by the same Fulton duo. Wong died in 2000 and he was about 85 or something. And he's so famous that Google, and I'd never heard of him, but now I want to go back to the into the archives of the of the real literature, you know, before it became trendy, because this is the real deal. And wow, I just love these stories so much. Uh, I didn't finish that thought. Wong is so famous, he got a Google Doodle on his 100th birthday. He was dead, but he got a Google Doodle. Here it is. I don't want to give you any spoilers, even though I think that you know, you're going to have a hard time finding this particular collection. The first story is called The Dog of Crossover Village. And if you know anything about dogs in Korean culture, and you are a queasy about that particular aspect of what in the countryside of Korea was customary with dogs, you probably might want to skip this story. I loved the story, but I did find that quite challenging read. But it's a really successful story. It's the longest story in the book. And it's successful because there's no personification. Am I using the word correctly? Personification? Personification, I think, is the word I'm looking for. But we're inside the stray dog that's wandering around this poor village. But the dog is not given human qualities. I th couldn't believe how much I enjoyed it because I don't really like reading fiction that have animals as main characters, not at all. But this one, the way it was written, it was a thoroughly enjoyable story. And yes, there is that challenging aspect for many readers of the old rural Korean customs. So you would have quite a challenge if that was something you didn't want to read about. The second story is called A Man, and I loved it as well. And it is about a hapless bachelor who or a hapless man who his first wife doesn't stick with him very long because his mother insists on sleeping between them in the bed for the first uh, several months of their marriage. <laughs> and it goes from there. It's comical and also quite a kind of slice of life sense of what 
and I don't know exactly when it was set, but uh, certainly you really feel bad for the protagonist, and then he starts a little restaurant, and he is interested in the new waitress that he hires, and uh, it's, a, it's kind of a sweet and memorable story. I loved it. And my favorite is the third story, Bibari, which is set on Jeju Island, and if you know anything about Korea, you know that it's uh, one of the famous holiday spots. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and when I was teaching English as a second language in Vancouver, I had hundreds and hundreds of Korean students, and they all loved telling me about Jeju Island. This is set on Jeju Island in about 1951, or thereabouts, and it concerns some refugees from the Korean War that have come from the mainland temporarily to get away get to safety. It's a mother and son. The son, Juni, is an adult, and he is a kind of a, has a bit of a delicate constitution, and his mother fusses over him because he gets an upset stomach and can't drink the water and stuff, and it's quite an interesting dynamic. But in this story in particular, the setting, the historical setting, is really well drawn, and I didn't know there was a rebellion on Jeju Island, and I wikipedia that, and just got enough information to understand that part of this story better. And Juni gets to the city, it's apparently it's the second biggest city on Jeju Island, and I have checked all of these pronunciations, if I could find them online. Sogwipo. And that's where he feels the most comfortable. And again, they're just waiting for a word from an uncle, and they're going to travel back to South Korea or somewhere safe. But they're waiting on Jeju Island in this city, Sogwipo, for a long time. And he starts watching the female divers. Jeju Island is very famous for these female divers. Henyo is the Korean name for these divers that dive for seafood, and that is the economic lifeblood of the island, and you've probably heard about them probably know more about them than I do. And he gets into a very unusual type of relationship that is based on mutual attraction, but it takes a very weird turn with one of the Henyo. And there is a lot about Jeju Island culture and the diving and Jeju dialect of Korean that's rendered in interesting ways in this English translation. I wanted to share some of that with you as an excerpt, but I, there was no way I would be able to pronounce enough of those words to not embarrass myself. What I am going to share with you as a sample of the writing is a passage that starts with describing the setting and then moves into Juni's observations of the Henyo, the uh, female divers. At the southern edge of town sits a one-story building with white plaster walls and a tin roof. There, buttons are made from the shells of clams, conch, and abalone gathered from the nearby seashore. The shells of Sogwipo are supposed to have the finest texture of any shells on the entire island. Next to this factory is a heap of shell fragments discarded during manufacturing. For some reason, the factory wasn't operating, and Juni never saw any activity inside. The building was hedged with sweet oleander, whose pale pink blossoms were at their peak. If you walk around to the other side of the factory, you come upon a small breakwater. Directly before it is Firewood Island, a small piece of land so close you can almost reach out and touch it. Trees ring the islet, which is otherwise flat. Just beyond this island is even tinier Mosquito Island, a graceful curve on the horizon, and the southernmost part of Sogwipo. Unlike its sister, Mosquito Island is crowned with a few trees, and rock beds form its circumference. The passage between the two islets is narrow, the current swift. Even the Henyo, or diving women, called Jamnyo by the people of Jeju, dare not venture too close. If you turn back from the end of the breakwater and follow the pumice-covered shore, another smallish island, Grove Island, comes into sight across the water. It might be about the size of Firewood Island. And, like Mosquito Island, it is topped with trees and is nothing but rocks at the edges. Grove Island is known for its medicinal herbs and for a variety of bellflower root with white flowers. In Sogwipo, with all its diving women, the most popular spot for their foraging is off this island. In May, when it's time to pick seaweed, they converge there from every direction. You can see groups of them all belonging to the Divers Guild, not only from Sogwipo, but from Bomok, the nearest village, and the villages of Donghong, some two and a half miles away, and Bofuan, five miles distant, all of them gathering in the waters about the island. It happened to be a busy time of year for farming when Juni and his mother arrived in Sogwipo, 
and so the throngs of divers hadn't yet appeared. Still, Juni could see a half dozen of them every day, diving and surfacing in the waters near Grove Island. He heard their distinctive whistling, noticed the way they dove, extending their legs straight up in the air like a mast. Sitting on the shore, he watched the women dive and tried to guess where they would surface, but it was generally a different place where they shot up, whistling. Next, he tried to guess how long they would stay underwater. Like the divers, he held his breath, but in some cases, he would have to take in air three times before the diver surfaced. So that gives you a little taste. If any of this sounds good, um, you can try to track this particular little volume of his short stories down or any of the other ones that are probably more readily available, translated by Bruce and Juchan Fulton. I'm certainly going to be tracking them down and getting to know what has been translated of the oeuvre of Wong Soon Wan. Thanks for watching. Oh.